Welcome to the next episode of Great More Story. This is going to be a big one. It's one of my discoveries that I'm most proud of. I've done an awful lot of work on this, and it's going to be at least a two-parter because I have so much to tell you about. It's, I've called it Discovering a Good Child, the story of Valerie Goodchild and the New Zealand Army in the Great War. Now, as so often has happened in many of my interesting little research projects that have come about when I've been looking into my grandfather's World War I experiences, so many of the interesting stories start from just a little bit of a tidbit that I decide to follow up and it leads me down a, a hole, a, not just a rabbit hole, but a rabbit warren. And in this case, the whole thing started with a single line in the war diary of the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance in January of 1915. Here it is, 27 January 1915. Mrs. Goodchild started using her motor ambulance, which is very useful. Now, here we have the New Zealanders. They've just arrived in Egypt in December. And so we're in Egypt. Somebody called Mrs. Goodchild is suddenly working with the New Zealanders. She didn't come with them from New Zealand, so presumably she lives in Egypt. She drives a motor ambulance, which is already pretty intriguing. And I had to thought, I've got to find out who is this person and what's her story. And I found out so much about her. As I said, it's going to be at least a two-parter. And I've limited myself in this episode to just talking about my story of discovery, what I discovered and how I discovered it. And I want to particularly mention a number of people who have been very, very useful to me. Now, let me start by going back to um, how deep down this rabbit warren I got, because it wasn't just um, Valerie Goodchild I ended up learning a lot about. It was a lot of her family, and particularly her father, which who was a, a very interesting chap, shall we say. So Valerie Goodchild was born Elsie Elwyn Valerie Neal. She seems to have dropped using Elsie very early. You see Elwyn used sometimes, but it seems pretty clear that she was called Valerie most of her life. And she was born in England in 1884. And their father... Um, William Neal was a bit of an interesting character. In fact, he could easily be somebody from a TV show or something like this. But I found the address of where they lived when they were young with their mother and father before they lost their mother in 1897. And it's that greenhouse there in a street, well, not so far from... Um, What's it called? Ah, I forget the name. One of the big parks in London. And their mother died, according to the death certificate, of carcinoma of the liver, dropsy, and exhaustion. Now, as I was to learn, their father doesn't seem to have particularly paid any, much attention to them. At least that's what I was told. And at least this was confirmed by a census of Britain that I found using Ancestry.com that showed that he wasn't living with the girls. Valerie and her sister Vere were living with their grandmother and their father was living who knows where. Now, in 1910, Valerie and her sister both went to Egypt and married English veterinary officers on the same day. How exactly did they meet them? Well, I really don't know. Um, it does... It, one possibility is that Thomas Goodchild's father had died a little bit earlier and he had traveled back for the for the funeral and perhaps th at that stage they'd contacted each other. Now, this looks very much like a semi-arranged marriage. So Thomas Goodchild and Frederick Mason married Valerie and Vere on the same day. Now, the culture has changed a lot since 1910, but in 1910, if you were 26 and 29 years old, as Valerie and Vere were, you'd be considered old maids on the, on the shelf. There, there wouldn't be much prospects for getting married anymore, so they may well have been willing to take what they could get. And there's an um, interesting similarity 
to how English culture used to be and how Japanese culture largely still is. A friend was telling me about an expression that's used in Japan for women who are 25 years or older and haven't got married. They're called Christmas cake woman. In other words, it's a kind of cake that's gone stale and after Christmas, nobody wants to eat them anymore. Chris, Kirisumasu Kiki, which is just almost a transliteration of Christmas cake. Um, not like that anymore, but that was how it used to be. Now, I've read a number of other stories about, you know, colonial officials who were working in Asia or India or the Middle East who wanted to find a wife and they had to find an English wife. The idea of mixed race marriages was out of the question. And they would often arrange to try and find a woman back in the home country to come out and marry them. So I suspect that was the case of um, Valerie and Vere and why they ended up moving to Egypt. Now, William Neal, the father. Well, this again was the account I was given. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it later about where I got this account. William's father shot himself on the 25th of July, 1868, having left the diplomatic service that spring and returned to London with his family. This was just after William's 11th birthday and must have been a traumatic time for him. The family story is that the suicide was provoked by a scandal that was then hushed up. So this is now the grandfather of Valerie Goodchild. And perhaps in some way this led to her father being a bit messed up himself because of this childhood trauma of his father committing suicide. And just by way of passing, I recently learned that in New Zealand, it's against the law to share the details of how somebody went about committing suicide. So just sharing that detail with you would presumably be illegal in New Zealand. Fortunately, I'm an American citizen and live in the United States. Now this photo is not them. I just was looking for a photo with a family with the right number of kids, but carrying on. Now, William Neal, Valerie's father, went bankrupt in 1899, and he went off the grid um, until he, the bankruptcy was discharged in 1927. Now, again, for American audiences, bankruptcy is relatively gentle. I mean, it's not a good thing, but it's you don't get sent to debt as prison or anything like that, which is what could definitely happen in England. So when he went bankrupt, he went into hiding and was living under a false name and all of the rest. Now, he had lost his wife, that was the mother of these two girls, and so he shacked up, I guess you'd have to call it, with another woman called Lydia. He couldn't marry her um, because he was off the grid. He was under a fake name, he officially didn't exist. So in order to properly register the marriage, he would have to come out of hiding and then you know the debt collectors would be after him. So this this was positively scandalous in this time period. So um, he and Lydia had eight children, and all eight children were unregistered. They were also off the grid because, again, to register the children would require him coming out in the open. And they didn't even know what their proper last name was because he was running around using the last name Vaughan when his real last name was Neil. So all of the children grew up calling themselves, you know, the, the Vaughan family. And uh, when the bankruptcy was finally discharged, I guess you'd call it something like the statute of limitations, he could officially marry Lydia and register all the children. I can just imagine the conversation, you know, you're going to whatever registry office Say, ah, yes, I would like to register my children. Uh, children, yes, so is it twins? Um, no. Well, how many children are we talking about here? Two or three? Um, eight. Uh, very well, sir. And um, I learned most of these details through the kind help of Ray Foster, who was the oldest grandson of Lydia. And he was very kind and sharing many family stories and details about William Neal and all of these various interesting stories that came out. And this is what Ray Foster had to say. William was energetic, inventive and plucky. He also appears, from my research and first-hand evidence, to have been selfish, duplicitous and manipulating, as well as jovial, amiable and pers personable. 
Now, he actually sounds like a classic, charming con man that you see in so many movies and dramas. I think he would make a wonderful fictional character if he wasn't actually real. And Ray Foster carries on. I'm sad to say that they, that's Valerie and Vere, have always been mystery people to me. My only information on them until relatively recently was their names. Even my mother, born in 1902, who one might assume had some contact with her elder half-sisters, never did. And I think her mother, Lydia, was possibly the jealous type, who did not want mention of her husband's earlier life. They were almost ethereal people, appearing briefly from time to time through the fog of our family history. And uh, Ray shared with me that he had never even seen a photo of either of them. But he did point me in the direction of this book, the 1906 edition of the Green Book, which was kind of like an English who's who of the theatre, William W. Vaughan Neal. So Vaughan was his middle name that he was using as his fake last name. Specialist in stage flying, born in Piraeus, Athens, son of W. B. Neal, His Majesty's Consul General for Greece and grandson of Judge Neal of Madras, and Sarah Smith, sister of Lady Henry Gordon Lennox, educated public school and at Magdalen College School, Oxford, blah, 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 married to Janet Byrne, that's his first wife, mother of Valerie, good child and others. Um, and Janet Byrne was daughter of Colonel Godfrey Byrne, 2nd Battalion of the 42nd Highlanders, formerly occupied as a general merchant. His first production, with which he was identified, was at the, was at the Canterbury, a theatre that is, in April 1895, since which he has been engaged in over 60 productions for leading managers and a bunch of famous theatre managers at the time. His most important work was the arrangement of the flying effects in Bearbone Tree's production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare, in 1899. He holds the record for re-rehearsals in the pantomime season of 1895 to 96, when he produced flying ballets at nine different theatres, taking rehearsals at Glasgow, Newcastle, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff and Bristol in 40 hours. Um, this flying ballet, it's kind of like the kind of things you see at Disneyland or modern shows, you know, where people are whizzing around, flying from, hanging from wires and flying around. So he seems to have been quite an inventive fellow with lots of little projects on the go. Now, Ray Foster continues. It should be stressed that I did not know my grandfather. He died 11 years before I was born. But my view of him was originally coloured by my mother. 103 years old at the time. Uh, he says mother. I wonder if he means grandmother. Um, but my view of him was originally colored by my mother, 103 years old at the time, almost tearfully recounting how he had totally ignored her on her eagerly anticipated 13th birthday. No, actually, it has to be. It has to be his mother. Now, by the way, this fellow in the photo is um, not William Neal. I don't have a photo of William, unfortunately. I actually borrowed a photo of my own great-grandfather. No card, no present, no acknowledgement. The hurt my mother felt was palpable 90 years later, and I consequently regarded him as a very self-centred man. I've got over that a little in subsequent years, as after my mother's death and amongst her effects, I found letters from him to her that were full of love and affectionate regard. However, I do think that he was probably a rather selfish and self-important man. His background could have played a significant part in that. His father, uncles and brothers were mostly quite senior diplomats or military officers. His aunt, Lady Gordon Lennox, was immensely wealthy, and her last husband was the brother of the Duke of Richmond. William's cousin, Lady Lushington, was married to a baronet and lived on a large country estate. I could quite imagine that being surrounded by such relatives lent William an air of entitlement and self-importance. His wife, Lydia, my grandmother, certainly put on considerable airs and graces until the end, although she was always lovely to my siblings and me. As a couple, they were financially irresponsible, living well beyond their means, and when their debts to tradesmen, etc., amounted to the extent that legal action was imminent, they were not beyond doing what was known then as a moonlight flit, i.e., leaving everything behind them and secretly moving to a new location where the living on credit process could start again. My mother told me of the embarrassment she felt on one such occasion when they bumped into the parents of her long-term beau at the train station. The parents inquired innocently as to where they were going with such mounds of luggage, and my mother, under instructions from her parents, had to lamely say that they were going on a short break to take the country air. She never saw or heard of her beau again, and that still pained her. 
During all this time, William was an undischarged bankrupt, having entered that state in 1899. He was not discharged until 1929, having lived fairly high on the hog for the intervening 30 years. So um, I, I don't think I'm overstating it when I say he was a bit of a charming con man. And the photo at the top, of course, doesn't show the family doing that. It's actually a bunch of New Zealand nurses waiting at a train station with all their luggage in England, I believe. Um, but it still was the closest I could find that seemed to fit a group of people on a train station with huge amounts of luggage. Amongst the papers still in my possession, says Ray Foster, ah, a 12-page document describing the Vaughan Neal anti-torpedo device for protection of merchant ships, the front piece of which proclaims that a provisional patent was granted on 14th November 1917. It is accompanied by three technical drawings of the device and a chart entitled Chart of Torpedo Attack on Broadside of Ship at 600 Yards, illustrating the relative positions of ship and torpedo during such an attack. I also recall a letter signed by Winston Churchill, who was then Minister for Munitions, being with these papers, but no longer, I'm afraid. And I looked up that detail to check when it would be. And uh, Winston Churchill was Minister for Munitions between 1917 um, up to January of 1919 under the government of Prime Minister Lloyd George. And this is a photo I took of a statue of Lloyd George that stands in uh, Cardiff in Wales. And my father, who was a Welshman, um, a number of times I remember him repeating the saying, um, my dad knew Lloyd George, Lord George knew my dad. I don't know the origins of that saying or what it really meant, but I re remember whenever the name Lloyd George would come up, or Lloyd George, if you're going to pronounce it correctly, um, my dad would always recite that little verse. I'm really, as I say, I don't know what it meant. And then other documents. A number of letters to William from the Mines Department, Naraguta, Nigeria, dated 1912-1913, acknowledging receipt of applications for exclusive prospecting rights in the area. And you know me, I like to follow these things up and try to work out what these details mean. And that led me down a whole other rabbit warren um, into this book about Nigeria and its tin fields. So clearly um, there was a bunch of people getting involved in tin prospecting. And in fact, um, this was exactly the right time period to correspond with this because they had just passed a bunch of new regulations for prospectors um, in northern Nigeria in 1910 and these new regulations were coming into effect in 1911 so 1912 1913 so I guess this was another one of the projects that William Neal had a, had on the boil trying to get rich somehow or other and this book contained all sorts of really interesting photos of what was going on. So you see uh, Naraguta, 190 bars of tin leaving camp by Asab pagans. And there's, you know, a surveying party and these uh, sluice things they use for washing out the tin. And they've got native miners busy digging out the tin and all of the rest, apparently. Tin was a big business in Nigeria at this time period. And while I was looking in this book and going through all these different plates and photos, I found this photo of this guy with this wonderful name has nothing else to do with the story, but I couldn't not mention him. Mr. S.R. Bastard, Chairman Champ and Gold Reefs of uh, West Africa Limited and other important Nigerian companies. And I had to know who was Mr. Bastard. And it turns out he was an interesting fellow in his own right. Seeger Richard Bastard, 1854 to 1921. Uh, he was a soccer player. He represented England exactly one time. So I guess he was good enough to make it to the national level, but not good enough to play more than once. I believe it was a match against Scotland. Uh, he played county cricket for a number of clubs, but he was actually best known for being a soccer referee. And in fact, was referee for an FA Cup um, final match, which is, if you know anything about so English soccer, was a big deal. And after his sporting career, he was, became a lawyer and ended up on the board of numerous different mining corporations. Oops. Oh, and the one other thing I should mention, um, I had to wonder what happened to the name Bastard. Well, he did get married and he did have a child, but it was a girl. So uh, I guess presumably she would have either got married and taken the husband's name or perhaps not got married at all. But at least in this line of the family, the Bastard line would have died out um, after one generation, because he only had a daughter. So no, no, no more bastard family.
<laughs> yes, so if you've ever wondered what a real bastard looks like, well, <laughs> there he is. Okay, moving on. More of Ray Foster's um, documents. Six-page original receipt from Fortnum and Mason Piccadilly for vast quantities of provisions, everything from tea to soft-nosed bullets, dated 16 September 1912 and to be delivered to the steamship Falaba to accompany William to Lagos, Nigeria. And there's a photo of Lagos, Nigeria, Nigeria with the uh, umbarina in the background. Now, again, you wonder, did he ever pay his bills for all of these vast quantities of provisions based on what Ray Foster tells us. I'm guessing he probably stiffed the people who supplied him. And then also a formal prospectus relating to the issue of shares in the Nigerian Produce Company Limited, formed to grow millet to feed the native mine laborers in Naraguta. Was this another of William's schemes, speculates uh, Ray Foster? Well, very, very likely. Having mentioned William's positive side, I shall restore balance by noting a further half-forgotten instance of his general lack of regard for others, as told by my mother. My mother and father were saving for the deposit on a house, and had been putting aside whatever little cash they could spare over a period of four or five years. Whilst my father was away working, my grandfather chided my mother for having money lying around, and insisted that she pass it to him for safekeeping. My mother was in awe of her father, and particularly malleable, so she complied. Needless to say, when my parents had selected the house they wanted to buy, and asked for the money, their savings no longer existed. The money could conceivably have gone to settle a pressing debt that threatened William's well-being, or just for living expenses. As children came along, my parents never managed to accrue the requisite sum again, and consequently lived in rented accommodation forevermore. I may be doing William a disservice, but I somehow feel that he would not have thought much more about a matter so devastating to my parents after the initial fuss had died down. Now, the photo on the right doesn't seem like much, really. It's just a typical tenement house, and it has, in this case, again, from my own family history, that's the house where my father grew up in Cardiff, Wales. And at least, it might not look like much, it's actually 16 feet wide. We measured it when we visited. Um, somewhat quite a lot deeper but only 16 feet wide but at least they owned it and well as i say it might not be much but it was their home and castle and uh it's a bit sad actually to see how run down it is and um, now that's from a google street view photo but um sadly because of the well the nature of william neal um, he deprived his own child of um the dream of home ownership now, moving on to another part of my adventure in researching the Good Childs. And, uh, well, if you, T. E. Lawrence Society, better known, of course, as Lawrence of Arabia. And uh, I was researching around, trying to find something about a good child in Egypt. I mean, good child is not exactly a common name. And I had a couple of false leads. There was a good child involved in archaeology that proved to be absolutely no connection. But on the website of the T. Lawrence Society, there was a list of past symposia. And under it, there was a talk that had been delivered. And it was called The Jetted Diary of Captain T.P. Goodchild during the Arab Revolt in 1916 by somebody called Philip Walker. Now, Google didn't help me much. Philip Walker is not exactly a rare name. Good child? You're trying to find a good child? No, you might have some luck. Believe me, I tried. I could not work out who Philip Walker was. And this is one of those occasions where social media, which gets criticized so much, comes into its own and can be a wonderful tool for connecting people. Because I followed the T.E. Lawrence Society on Facebook, and I sent them a direct message say explaining my problem that that i was trying to get hold of philip walker because i'd been researching a valerie goodchild who lived in egypt and i wondered if this captain tp goodchild could be in some way connected to him and not long after i was delighted to receive an email from philip walker saying yes yes i believe that um that valerie goodchild was the wife of my guy captain goodchild and who was Captain Goodchild? Well, later promoted in World War I to Major, 
and here he is in an, a, the Egyptian's hoo-hoo of 1939, La Mondaine, Mondaine Egyptian. Major T.P. Goodchild, Major Thomas Philip Goodchild, OBE, Secretary of the Alexandra Sporting Club, and Madame, Madame Nee, A.V. Neal, MBE, um, and that's Valerie Goodchild, you know, Nee Neal, her maiden name being Neal, living at number 14, Rue Schutz, Schutz, Alexandria. And um, Philip Walker had done a tremendous amount of research. It was through him that I got in communication with Ray Foster because um, he had found him first. And he shared a whole bunch of details that he had found about Valerie Goodchild, incidental to his research on Thomas Goodchild. And I thought, oh, no. You know, I thought I'd found an absolutely original research project that nobody had discovered before. This was going to be mine. And then Philip Walker beat me to it. And even though I found a few things that he hadn't found, he'd already done a lot of work. And you know, it was kind of like, Oh, well, I thought, you know, the archaeologist who thought he had discovered the new site, but actually somebody got there first. But Philip was a very kind and generous man. And he said, oh, no, I don't mind. Um, my interest is in the husband. Take everything I've got about Valerie. She's all yours. So Philip Walker is a kind and generous man who had done an enormous amount of research, primarily on Thomas Goodchild, but also had was shared a lot of information with me, including putting me in touch with Ray Foster. Now, on that note, somewhat later, he wrote this book called Behind the Lawrence Re Legend, The Forgotten Few Who Shaped the Arab Revolt. And, and I want to tell you his story. The, his whole research and chasing down his own particular rabbit warren started when he went to a car boot sale in and I'm remembering what he told me. I think it was Oxford. Um, and if for Americans, a car boot sale, well, a car boot is a trunk. So it would be like people going to a parking lot and, you know, just selling things out of their trunk, selling knickknacks, junk, kind of like a farmer's market or, a, you know, that, that kind of, you know, just a, like a Saturday fair in a, in a parking lot somewhere. Anyway, um, and somebody was selling a bunch of junky old paperbacks and amongst the other things there was this old leather-bound diary handwritten and he thought well, that looks kind of curious and he bought it on a whim and it was much too late when he discovered what it was to go back and ask this guy where exactly this diary came from so he has no clue so he had and he gradually worked out through piecing through this diary that it was the diary of Thomas Goodchild. I believe it was his diary of 1916. And he had been sent on a camel buying expedition um, down to Yemen, where he was um, involved with a number of the major Arab leaders who took part in the Arab revolts that, um, you know, the movie Lawrence of Arabia popularized and all the rest. And it mentions that he shared a cabin with a young English officer who was going down um, to Arabia at the same time as him. And Philip Walker, putting two and two together and checking the dates very carefully, realized that the young English officer who he shared a cabin with was none other than T.E. Lawrence. And that, so they both traveled together to um, Arabia and, uh, well, the rest became history. And anyway, this was his initial opening, but that got him really interested. What about all the other people who were there? Everybody knows about T. Lawrence, but it's not like he was there on his own. There were other Englishmen. And F Philip actually tracked down the families of quite a number of other people who were running like the English consulate um, and all of those kind of things. And they shared with him family papers that had been in private hands ever since. So you would think that a topic like Lawrence of Arabia would have been done to death and there couldn't possibly be anything new that could come to light. But Philip Walker's book, which is only out a few years, is positively crammed with brand new primary documents about all the other people who were there behind, as it says, the man, the men behind the myth. <laughs> 
Um, absolutely great book, and let me really, really recommend it. If you're interested in Lawrence of Arabia, if you've only if you've read the other accounts but you haven't read this one, well, you're missing an enormous amount of of background. Now, I, as I continued to hunt for more information about Valerie Goodchild, I stumbled across an eBay listing advertising this particular issue of um, well, it was a weekly magazine published during World War One called The War Illustrated. And uh, and I have to confess, I ended up spending several hundred pounds to buy a complete set, but I will say it was money well spent. So it was a weekly publication that gave you, well, lots of pictures and some stories about what was going on in the war. Obviously, since it was being published at the time, it it's filled with some propaganda and other things. Um, but very consciously, they were telling the readers, remember to save all your issues and at the end of the year, have it bound to, together in hardback. And by the time they got to the end of World War One, well, as you can see, volumes eight to nine. Um, and so they were a weekly, you know, soft cover tabloid, I guess you'd call it. But now, well, I have in my office, I have all um, eight volumes sitting there with all these different um war stories and lovely pictures. Anyway, in this particular issue of in July of 1915, we have this page called Scenes in the Ante Room to the Dardanelles. And that top left picture, which I've enlarged on the right, Red Cross cars at Cairo awaiting the arrival of the hospital trains from the Dardanelles. The lady in the photograph is Mrs. Goodchild, who drives her own motor ambulance. And I thought, wonderful, I found it. Because, as I said, even Ray Foster had already told me he'd never seen a photo. Um, and at this point, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm doing more than just some historical research. I'm doing serious community service. And so as fast as I could, I shot off um, the scans to, um, to Ray Foster. And it's a bit of a shame because you can see it's pretty grainy. Um, and you can't see her face very well, but considering he had never seen a photo of his, what would, he, what would she be, his half-auntie? Mm. I, um, I really felt really happy that I was able to share it. And, and there she is, confirmation that beyond, well, just that brief mention in the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance War Diary. And then as I dug around more, I found other, other books. This book, Make Her Praises Heard Afar. The Untold Story of New Zealand Woman in World War One, by Janet Tolleton. And there was this um, one photo in there. It's got Valerie Goodchild in her ambulance working at the hospital the New Zealanders had been given. Now, uh, before I go on, just to mention this book, it's an absolutely brilliant title, Make Her Praises Heard Afar, because, again, it's about New Zealand woman in World War One, But... Make her praises heard afar is one of the lines from the New Zealand national anthem, so particularly appropriate for a topic about New Zealand history. Um, Make her praises heard afar, God defend New Zealand, or something like that. I'm not going to sing any more for you. Now, how else can you start digging? Well, what's this thing under it that people just ignore? P A C O L L 6972 9 55 2 ATL. Well, fortunately, I've been doing enough research by now to realize ATL, Alexander Turnbull Library. That's the, the um, National Library of New Zealand. And that is a record number. Now, I emailed the Alexander Turnbull Library to make an inquiry about, you know, I've seen this photo in this book. It's got this reference, this collection number. Could you please tell me what it is? And a very kind um, person working at the Alexander Turnbull Library emailed me back and looked at, looked, looked around and said, well, it's a box of photos just sitting loose, not even in a photo album. And I asked her nicely if there was any chance that she could look through it and see if there were any other photos of Mrs. Goodchild and to please tell me, you know, who did the photo, who did this box of photos belong to and so on and so forth. And she found one for me. Now, it's not the most wonderful photo in the world. You can see the framing is awful. It's, um, whoever the photographer was cut the head off the guy on the back left. And 
she sent me a copy of the front and a copy of the back. Now the pencil writing on this is pretty hard to read, but the first one was relatively easy to reverse engineer because, you know, I've been researching what's been going on with New Zealand troops in Egypt, and I was familiar with the name of many of the hospitals. So Pont de Cuba as the name of the number one um, New, the New Zealand General, General Hospital in um, Cairo. I was familiar with that, so that wasn't too hard to read. The name underneath it, Campbell. Well, I, I read that pretty easy, perhaps because we have an old family friend um, called Mary Campbell, so I'm pretty familiar with that name as a not uncommon name originally from Scotland, so deciphering that one wasn't so hard. Mrs. Goodchild at the bottom, well, that wasn't so bad either. And having seen her before a couple of times, it was fairly easy to work out that that indeed was Mrs. Goodchild. Now, the name above it, that really had me stumped. What the heck did that say? And after looking at it a lot, I decided that at least the beginning was W-I-D-D. -D. wasn't really sure about the rest of it, but W-I-D-D -D seemed reasonably safe, or maybe M-I-D-D. -D. And in fact, I talked with my mother and got her to pull out the New Zealand white pages, you know, the phone book, and look up any name starting with W-I-D-D -D and read them all out to me. What family names are there in New Zealand that could start with W-I-D-D? -D? And soon enough, she got to a name Widowson. And again, I'd call this reverse engineering because once you have the name in your head, Widowson, could that say Widowson? And I'm confident now that absolutely it does. And that then gave me some terms to search for and I was able to work out that there were two New Zealand doctors working in Egypt at the time, Captain John George Campbell of the New Zealand Medical Corps and Captain Eric Wooderson also of the New Zealand Medical Corps. Now, I was able to positively ID John Campbell because through Facebook and searching for him, I actually tracked down his granddaughter and she was able to positively confirm that yes, that man standing with his legs crossed at the front was um, was indeed her grandfather, which of course means the other guy is um, Widowson. Now, the box of photos belonged to Dr. Agnes Bennett, and I found some other photos of her, and I can't promise you that's her, but uh, in another photo of Agnes Bennett, there was a photo of her wearing a hat very, very like that. Now, I've seen other people wearing similar hats as well, so it doesn't prove it. The, the other possibility, of course, is that she's holding the camera, because after all, it wasn't her box of photos, but who can say? And uh, this was a photo shared with me by Lynn, um, Lynn Campbell. I think that's her last name. But anyway, the granddaughter of John Campbell, and there he is in 1916. Now, you've seen the photo on the top left, you've seen the photo on the top right, they're both from the photo collection of Agnes Bennett, and uh, that gave me something to start researching. Who's Agnes Bennett? She clearly has some kind of, kind of connection with um, Valerie Goodchild, because she's got, you know, at least a couple of photos of her in her photo album. And then there was a different photo album, which I'll get to later, which was um, showing these two photos in the middle. There's Mrs. Goodchild driving a motor ambulance, and you can bet every time I found one of these photos, I shot it off to Ray Foster and said, I got another one. And down on the bottom left, we'll get to that one last, you can see there's Valerie next to her ambulance alongside a bunch of other um, ambulance drivers, but she's the only female there. Now, who was Dr. Goodness me. I can't even spell Agnes. Okay, just please ignore the typo there. She's not Angus Bennett. She's Agnes Bennett, but my mistake, I apologize. And uh, there's a couple of photos of her. Now, who was she? Well, fascinating lady. She was born in Australia, in Sydney, and she wanted to train as a doctor, but she wasn't allowed to train as a doctor in Australia at the time. So she said, well, screw you, I'm going to train as a doctor anyway. She borrowed money, travelled to Scotland, where they would accept her for medical training, and did indeed become a qualified doctor. She then returned to New Zealand, well, not returned, she went to New Zealand, 
and she became the first female doctor to get a job at a public hospital. Well, of the, probably not surprisingly that it was a maternity hospital because you know that was the most likely job they would give to a female doctor but she was a real what do you call it, breaking the glass ceiling a trailblazer a feminist icon call her what you will and uh, and when world war one broke along broke out she said well i'm ready to serve i'll go out with the troops i'll do what i can and she offered it to the New Zealand government. She offered it to the Australian government. And the military said, no, thank you. We don't think we need your help. No. Does, does Agnes Bennett look like the kind of person who's going to take no for an answer? If you realize that she absolutely was not going to take no, you'd be right. So she bought her own ticket to France. And she was heading for England because she thought that's where she was needed. But when her ship got to Egypt, by that stage, the wounded from Gallipoli were flooding back and the medical facilities in Egypt were absolutely overwhelmed, but with the hundreds of wo wounded men pouring in and she realized that was where she needed. So she canceled her plans to head to England and said, this is where I'm needed. And so she remained in Egypt and became absolutely critical there. And uh, some of like some of the accounts of her say she was the first um, female officer, but it's not quite as simple as that. They gave her the status of a captain, but she wasn't technically a captain. She didn't get formal rank till much later. Um, but well, she was definitely the first woman doctor in any part of the British Medical Corps anywhere in the world. Later on, she would actually um, head the American unit at the Scottish Women's Hospital at the Macedonian front attached to the Serbian army. So really interesting woman. And, you know, you, I really wish I knew more about what her connection was to Valerie Goodchild. But sadly, that's all I've got. Now, another person who helped me, and I found her through a news story. This was from a New Zealand newspaper, the New Zealand Herald. And there was the story, World War One ambulance driver Deborah Pitts Taylor remembered in Capital's Great War Exhibition. And uh, I won't tell you how because I don't want you to bother her, but I was able to track down um, an email address for Janet Freighter and contact her and explain again that I was researching Valerie Goodchild. And I happened to know that after she worked as an ambulance driver in Egypt, she'd worked as an ambulance driver in England. And so if um, your grandmother, Deborah Pitts Taylor, had worked as an ambulance driver in England. There can't have been that many um, women working as female ambulance drivers for the New Zealand military. And I said, I wonder if they knew each other. And on a trip back to New Zealand, Janet very generously invited me to her home and allowed me to take photos of Deborah Pitts Taylor's diaries and photo albums and a dress book and all sorts of things. And we were able to find, well, there's Deborah Pitts Taylor. And well, there's a photo I took of um, from the diary. Unfortunately, nowhere in the diary does she ever mention Mrs. Goodchild. But it wasn't entirely a waste of time. Well, the diary itself is interesting anyway. But in the photo album, there was a little photo, not a very large one at all. And the caption described that it was Deborah Pitts Taylor in the middle, and I've blown it up as much as I can. And on the left, the somewhat more stout figured woman was Mrs. Goodchild. So there she is in England. I got another photo of her. <laughs> Shot it off to Ray Foster. I got another one, which um, considering that, you know, it's this random woman who's working in Egypt and England and that I decided I wanted to hunt down. I'm, I was feeling pretty proud of myself to find this number of images. There she is. This is Good Child in England. And there's this little address book. And twice Mrs. Goodchild is mentioned. There's once when she's at Oakland's Park Hotel in Weybridge. And there's another one where she's actually at Hotel des Anglais in uh, La Tonquette, France. And I'll um, talk about that in the next episode. And uh, Philip Walker, as part of his research into the Goodchilds, had um, got onto the British consul in Egypt and got him to go and get some photos of him. And this particular photo is where Valerie and her husband lived in Alexandria for a while. 
So this is 24 Ismailia Street, Alexandria. Well, that's what it's called now. It was called Rue Station Schutz or something like that in, um, back in their day. And then again, this is all from Philip Walker. May 1943, they moved to 15 Rue Station Schutz in the expat area of Ramla, Alexandria, very close to Valerie's sister there and her husband, Major Frederick Mason, who lived at number 10. Thomas Goodchild died in December of 1943 at the Anglo-Swiss Hospital and Valerie Goodchild's address at the time of her death in 1979 was the same as her sister, 10 Rue Station Schutz. It's possible that she moved in at some stage with her sister and brother-in-law after Thomas died in 1943. Well, that kind of makes sense. And here we are from Ancestry.com, the, uh, the probate document. And down the bottom, there it is, Elsie and Valerie Goodchild, the address where she lived at the time of her death, and the address of the solicitor in London who was handling it. And Philip Walker had actually got hold of them and spoken to somebody who'd worked there for many years. But sadly, the law office had no records of it. And because neither Valerie or Vere had any children, you have to imagine that come 1979, there was nobody who wanted any of the papers or records that must have been kept there. There must have been so much, so many photos and diaries. Who knows what could have been there? And probably it all just got swept into a skip and thrown out. Uh, just the accident of history. Some things survive and some things don't. I can only imagine what must have been at that address when... Um, when Valerie died in 1979. And um, the other th another thing that the British Consul provided Philip Walker was um, he'd worked out which um, cemetery they were buried at in Egypt and got him to go there. And there it is, a completely unmarked plot now. The gravestone is missing. You wouldn't even know it. Now, between the two of them, um, Major Goodchild had no BE. Valerie Goodchild, th for a service with the New Zealanders, had been awarded an MBE. Both of them interesting and important figures, and that's what's remains of their grave. So sometimes I'm just researching history. Other times I feel like I'm, I'm on a, a crusade, if you like, a crusade to make sure people don't get forgotten, a crusade to tell the stories of people whose stories hadn't been told. I mean, Agnes Bennett and other, other ones, their stories have been told by other people. But the story of Valerie Goodchild, no, her, her story hasn't been told by anyone. She's got a couple of references here and there. And uh, this was the end of episode one, which was my story of discovering Valerie Goodchild. Um, the next episode will be what I uncovered, what she did, where she went, and all of the interesting adventures she got up to. And, uh, well interesting lady and I do hope you'll watch part two once I get around to making it. Thank you. That's all I have for you today.